Okay, hi everyone. We should now be live. <clears throat> so, hello and welcome to How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, uh, week one webinar. Hi from me, Donald Robertson. Just rearranged my windows. Uh, here in Nova Scotia. Okay, hi everyone. We should now be live. <clears throat> so, hello and welcome to get rid of the echo. Okay, so I'm here in Nova Scotia, uh, but it's snowing outside actually. So if you want to just say hi and where you're from in the chat section on the right hand side, uh, I just like to check in with that occasionally and let me know that you can hear and see me okay. Also, if you're watching the replay of this video, then please just say hi in the comments section below and tell us where you're watching from. Um, things like this actually help everybody feel more engaged with the course so you know if you can see other people uh, like tuning in from other parts of the world and stuff like that it helps to create more of a kind of community feel i think also helps if you use a photograph of yourself in your profile and i think it helps if people use their real names as well in the discussion forums it creates more of a sense of a, like a real classroom or a community developing okay so uh, the goal for today is basically a little bit different from the other webinars. It's just a little bit, slightly more of a gentle introduction today, slightly more of a general orientation. We've got more content in week one, so that means uh, I'll cover it in a slightly more cursory manner. And then in the subsequent webinars, I'm going to dive a little bit more deeply into the, the weekly topics. It's also uh, an opportunity to talk about how to make best use of the course and all of these webinars are an opportunity for you just to ask any questions that you've got and I'll do my best to answer those. Uh, so having done the introductions, the agenda for today is then to do a little bit of general housekeeping, uh, give an overview of what's in the preliminary section, what's in week one and I'll talk a little bit about Marcus's life, how stories from it are relevant and I also like to use the webinars to talk more about practical techniques as well. So we've got a lot to cover today. I'll try and fit some practical stuff in. Uh, in the subsequent webinars, we'll uh, focus a little bit more on the, the Stoic psychology, the practical stuff. So let me just check in the audio's good. We've got people from Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, Sheffield. I used to live in Sheffield. I went to university in Sheffield. Nova Scotia, there's always at least one person from Nova Scotia. I don't know if you can see if I wave out my window at you. Okay, so other practical stuff, housekeeping there. I timed it and I think on YouTube Live we experienced a delay of 30 seconds. Uh, incidentally, just when you're kind of chatting and stuff. So I won't see your comments immediately. Uh, if you want to address a question to me directly, sometimes if there's a lot of people here, there, it's kind of hard for me to follow the chat, uh, especially occasionally people start having a discussion among themselves. But if you put at Donald in front of any questions that you want me to answer, then I'm more likely to spot them and be able to answer them during the, the webinar. If I miss any questions, I think unfortunately the live chat disappears at the end. But if you, want, you have a question and I miss it, come back to the link about five minutes after the broadcast is finished and there'll be the usual permanent comment section underneath the recording of the video and then you can post questions there and they'll be permanently there and I can answer them more easily. Today's session I'm guessing is probably going to take 45 minutes but I'll fess up and say I'm pretty terrible and always have been at estimating the length of these things. The, uh, I'm guessing it'll be 45 minutes, that's roughly what they usually work out as. Um, although it's live, just a couple of practical things. You can pause the stream if you need to and then it's recorded so I, I think it catches up and like I said, there'll be a recording permanently available via the same link afterwards. Um, other housekeeping e stuff. They you should all have received three downloadable ebooks in PDF, EPUB, and Kindle Mobi format. Uh, there's Marcus Aurelius in the Roman Histories, the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius in the George Long translation, and the Eulogium on Marcus Aurelius, which is one of my favourite books about the, the life of Marcus. So if you're really keen, there's a, there's a lot of additional reading that you can wade through there. Um, in the 
welcome page, the introductory letter to the preliminary section. There are links to those three ebooks, just in case you're having any, any problems finding them. And in that welcome letter, there's also a clickable hidden HTML section that I'm just testing out because I want to do more instructional design stuff in the course and by putting more interactive elements in where possible. Um, and I'm trying to get that to work in Internet Explorer at the moment, but it, it might take a little bit of tweaking. It should work in other browsers though. Other kind of technical stuff. The, there's an app for this course provided by the platform that we use, which is called Teachable. Uh, it's only in for Apple products at the moment, for iOS. And it's not in the App Store right now, unfortunately, because they pulled it for some reason from the store and Teachable have to make changes to it and then it's going to be put back up. So if you have the app, it will still work. If you haven't downloaded it yet, you may have to wait a few weeks before it becomes available again. Unfortunately, that's outside of my control. Uh, some stuff about emails. Um, we're going to send emails to you just with the link for the webinars. The link for each weekly webinar will also be in the introductory section of each week. And uh, so make sure you check your spam or ideally add the domain name, donaldrobertson.name, to your whitelist or safe sender list on your email client so that all the emails definitely get through to you. There's also a closed Facebook group where you can ask questions about this course. And the link to that is in the preliminary section if you haven't found that already. And I'd encourage you to go there. And so but that's all the kind of practical housekeeping stuff that I wanted to mention. And then I'd like to say something just kind of generally about how to get the best out of the course. So I've been teaching for pretty much my whole like, career like, as a, a trainer, psychotherapist and running personal development workshops and doing e-learning and stuff as well. And I think the most helpful thing to say about any course is the people, students sometimes kind of assume that everyone is the same as them, but actually particularly in a course like this, and particularly in e-learning where you can't really see the other people in the course, it's helpful to bear in mind that everybody is different and has different needs and expectations from the training. So, you know, some people will say they want more history from the course. Other people will say they want less history. Some people say they want more psychology and practical stuff. Other people say, yeah, they're not really interested in that. So one way of doing it is just to kind of pare down the content and try and pick what's going to be most relevant. In this course, I've given you, I've gone the other way and I've just given you everything. So that means that you may have to be, you probably will have to be a little bit more selective in your use of the course content. Uh, so if you're not so much into the history, just skim it. Like you don't have to read or watch or listen to everything that's in this course. Treat the content uh, as optional and be selective about the way that you use it because I've deliberately just kind of given you the full range of stuff. If you are into history, there'll be loads of it for you. If you're into psychology, there'll be loads of it for you. Like if you're kind of looking for a description of Stoic philosophy, there's loads of that as well. And you may want all of that, you know, in which case you might find that you can do it in a week or some people find they don't have enough time to cover it all in one week. You know, again, in which case you might want to do it more at your own pace or you may want to just watch the videos and then come back and do more of the reading later. So basically just be flexible about the way that you use the content and adapt it to what your needs and requirements are because everybody doing the course is gonna be in a slightly different situation. Let me just check. Cool. Uh, so a little bit about the schedule. You'll get a couple of automated emails you get an email every week uh, saying when the next section of the course has been published and then a day later you'll get access to some bonus content which is more optional stuff like it's stuff that I may have removed from the course but I've just left it in so you can have it if you want. I'll talk about some examples of that in a moment. Okay so let's dive in and, and look a little bit more at the content. So I have to kind of say a little bit about the preliminary content which most of you should already have, have looked at and then I'll, I'll get into the guts of the week one content which is 
there's a lot to it basically it, it, it kind of grew a little bit over time uh, so first thing about the preliminary section you might want to go back if you've already gone through it and look at the discussion parts particularly the main discussion area uh, where there are now over 130 comments that have been posted by people in the group so if you were one of the first people to enroll you probably didn't see the comments from the people that enrolled after you you might want to just go back and have a quick look at that and i'd encourage you to read other people's comments Again, uh, something I should point out is there are going to be way too many comments, particularly towards the beginning of the course, for you to read all of them. So don't feel obliged to read through every single comment that's been posted by other students, unless you've got a lot of time on your hands and you really want to do that. Just have a, a skim through some of the more recent ones, and if you want to reply to other people's comments, that's awesome because it helps everybody then to feel more engaged with the course. There are also links in the preliminary section to the previous set of weekly webinars, which if you really want to, you can go back and watch. They'll be kind of broadly similar in content to the live ones that I'm doing now, but I kind of like to do them live. So you can go back and you can watch the previous versions if you really want to. Uh, there's also an audio exercise, which is the Stoic Attitudes recording. And uh, that's a, a new version of that recording that I made for this course. I simplified it a little bit, I improved the audio quality on it, and it's not everyone's cup of tea to do that. It's a little bit like a self-hypnosis recording. So sometimes people are like, nah, I'm not really into that sort of thing, but I was surprised the majority of people that I've given it to are really into it. And you know, often people are really looking for a way to embrace stoicism to really implement it and if you want to really absorb stoicism as a daily psychological practice that is a very powerful way of doing it there are many people that listen to that recording every day and they tell me they get a lot of benefit out of it but it might not be for you if you're kind of undecided about how stoic you want to be that kind of assumes that you really want to internalize stoic ideas um, so you know it kind of depends how committed to stoicism you are or what stage in your studies you're at. The impossible quiz, uh, Just sometimes I like to just throw in a few statistics and bits of information you might find interesting. The average score in that's 25%. There you go. So there's a norm for you to compare yourself against. The bonus section has some uh, content for the, the, for the preliminary section. There's a bonus area which has been, which will be published tomorrow actually. And it's got an interview with William O. Stevens, who wrote a book on Marcus Aurelius. It's one of the best commentaries on Marcus Aurelius, called Marcus Aurelius, A Guide for the Perplexed. It's got a bunch of HD wallpapers, desktop wallpapers with quotes and pictures of Marcus Aurelius. If you don't have those already, they were designed by my graphic designer, Rocio de Torres, who does a lot of the artwork for the courses and downloads and stuff. There's also, again, maybe this is more for kind of history nerds, but there's a, a, a navigable Google map showing the locations that are mentioned in the Roman histories talking about Marcus Aurelius. So uh, key locations in Marcus Aurelius' life, if you like. And, you know, I, I find that really interesting just to kind of look around and think about where he was in relation to some of the things that were going on and how far away some of this stuff uh, that was happening actually was and so on it's, it's kind of helps maybe to clarify things although it may be that you need to read a little bit of the history to understand the significance of some of the locations if you click on the little stars there'll be little tiny description that's still kind of explaining why something is relevant okay so week one is the main thing that i want to discuss today but even that divides into a number of sections it was originally meant to be about anger management and then I realised a lot of people doing this course needed a primer on stoicism and in doing that I realised it was also going to be important to talk about a stoic technique called contemplation of the state, the sage and some stuff that kind of goes along with that. So there's a fairly extensive series of three videos that provide a pretty thorough but quite concise 
introduction to, to stoicism so hopefully that's going to be a good kind of launching pad for you you know so it brings you up to speed with what stoicism really teaches and then that helps you to understand what's really going on in the meditations okay so uh, I was going to say a little bit more about how to use the content just that um, actually the difference between different students there was a there was someone who did this course before and did the whole of week one in one day but I think almost everyone else is going to take more than a week to go through all of that content so if you kind of wanted to keep up with the course if you you know you could do it in your own speed but if you do want to do it in four weeks you're probably going to need to kind of be selective particularly in week one and just do the content that you think you can fit in in terms of your schedule and then move, I would suggest moving on to week two. Uh, the main things in that respect are the videos and the discussions and you can treat all the reading as optional if you want. What I've done this time that wasn't in previous versions is that now I've had a little bit more time to review the course contents and add some stuff where there's reading, I've also generally tried to add an audio recording of me basically saying the same stuff. So, and I've kept the reading. So you have pretty much everywhere there's a video or an audio, you have a written transcript as well. As an aside, that means that, you know, you don't have to read the transcript if you're listening to the audio. Obviously, some people have asked me about that. Of course, if you just listen to the audio, that's good enough. But some people prefer to read, some people prefer to listen. You'll probably get through it more quickly if you if you listen to the recording, maybe. Uh, I'll leave that up to you guys to decide, but don't feel that you have to do both. And I, most of the videos are downloadable, by the way, so you could also, and the audio, so you could download the videos or audio and, and access them offline, uh, which is useful in Nova Scotia sometimes when the power lines go down. I can do stuff on my laptop, like even if uh, even if it were sitting by candlelight. So, in these videos, I'll generally summarise, simplify some of the content that you're about to cover in the week ahead, and sometimes I'll talk about things that people have asked me about between the webinars. Um, there's something I want to mention today that somebody had brought up actually. Um, today. A little bit more of a general orientation, though, like I mentioned earlier. So those three videos at the beginning talk about the stoic goal of life, the three topics in stoicism, the virtues, the good passions, the bad passions. And there's a bunch of infographics that Rossio designed that, that go in there as well, like just to kind of make things a little bit more uh, accessible to add some more media for you. So it's kind of a little bit more engaging. Try to make this part, of course, as engaging as possible. Uh, you know, so it's mainly video content with slideshows and stuff. So hopefully it makes it easy for you to kind of get uh, up to speed on stoicism. So what is the goal of life in stoicism? Well, basically it was, the classic formulation is living in agreement with nature. The connotation of that is partly living in a consistent manner. Um, you know, living with integrity. The, the Stoics tend to talk about that as a kind of theme, that the, the rational man just doesn't vacillate or fluctuate in his mood. That's a kind of a mark for irrationality in a way. So the rational man is kind of consistent. He's not easily swayed by uh, external events. He adapts to them, but he's not overly changeable. But mainly living in agreement with nature for Stoics means living rationally. They believe that fundamentally we are reasoning creatures. It doesn't mean that's the only part of our nature, but they think, in a sense, it's the highest or the most important part of our nature. So someone who fulfills their potential as a human being is going to be living rationally, guided by reason. And to live rationally is for Stoics to live wisely. If we perfect reason, then we become wise. And so the goal of life, in a sense, is wisdom or living wisely. And the other virtues in Stoicism, uh, normally they're formulated in terms of the four cardinal virtues of Greek philosophy, wisdom or prudence, justice or uh, virtue in, in our relationships with other people, uh, moderation or temperance and courage. So wisdom, justice, 
temperance and courage, basically the cardinal virtues. Uh, for Stoics, wisdom is really the most fundamental one, and the other virtues are, in a sense, consist of wisdom applied to our actions or to other areas of our life. So. Uh, wisdom applied to our desires is temperance. Wisdom applied to fears, emotions is uh, is courage or endurance. Um, the Stoics believed that certain desires and emotions, which they call passions, so the term passions includes both desire and emotion, that these follow inevitably when we place more importance on external things than we do upon wisdom or upon the goal of life. And those are the unhealthy, irrational, or excessive passions which Stoic therapy aims to help us overcome, basically. So the Stoic goal is to be free from these unhealthy passions, and yet full of rational love, is how Marcus describes it, philostorgia, a particular type of love or affection. There are, therefore, also healthy passions, which are grouped under the headings of joy, and a kind of healthy aversion, which is a bit like what we mean perhaps by conscience, and also goodwill or love or affection, like wishing other people well. So there is this positive side to Stoic emotion, which people often overlook. The Stoics aren't uh, by, in any sense just about eliminating emotion. Uh, what they want to do is transform what they consider to be irrational, excessive and unhealthy emotions into these healthier ones. But the emotions, in a sense, are secondary to the Stoics because they believe that they follow as a consequence of our value judgments. So really it's our underlying beliefs and value judgments that they think we should be primarily concerned with. And then the emotions will kind of follow as a consequence of that. There's a section in the course uh, about Marcus the Man. Uh, so right into the biographical part early on, a good way of doing that is to say, was he a good ruler? What sort of guy was he? And we know quite a bit about his character from various Roman histories, from the Historia Augusta, from Cassius Dio's Historia Romana, uh, from a historian called uh, Herodian, and from other bits and pieces of historical evidence. So we know Marcus was not gloomy or depressed, we're told, but he was good-humoured. And so people often think the meditations makes him seem kind of melancholic, but apparently he wasn't like that in real life. You know, he's doing these kind of contemplative exercises in the meditations. There's a formality to the meditations. So he's contemplating his own death and some quite negative things. But that's an exercise. It's not a reflection of his natural character. And in the 19th century, that claim that he was a kind of genial, good-humoured type guy was substantiated by the discovery of a bunch of letters that Marcus had written to his rhetoric tutor, Fronto. And in those letters, we get a real revelation, a real glimpse into Marcus Aurelius's genuine private character. It's an extraordinary thing to find out. And he comes across as a surprisingly good-humoured, incredibly affectionate man, like even uh, by modern standards, we'd, we'd actually be surprised at the level of affection that he shows towards his family friends. He's always telling them how much he loves them and stuff. So very different from the, the personality that people might have assumed, but consistent with the way he's described in, the, in histories. There's also, I haven't added this to the course yet, but one of the things people asked me before was, well, if we do a whole course with Marcus, do we not inevitably end up kind of idealising him and other criticisms that might be made of Marcus? And I guess the two things I'd say briefly about that are the criticisms that people often mention now are very different from the criticisms that were made of him during his lifetime. Um, and if we look at the, the Roman histories, there are some criticisms, or quite a few actually, mentioned of him. And I wrote an article summarising what the main ones are. And, you know, many of them actually are sort of equivocal. We can, we can interpret them uh, in different ways. Some of them are possibly gossip that we can dismiss. But, you know, possibly there's a grain of truth in them. And then there are probably some legitimate criticisms of him. And the one thing that he was never accused of was personally uh, being involved in the persecution of Christians 
Although, and in fact, like he's described by two of the church fathers as being a protector of Christians. Uh, but funnily enough, that's one of the main things that people tend to, to ask about today. And the other thing, sometimes people think, was he a warmonger? Someone mentioned that the other day, and he's never accused of that in the in the Roman histories. On the contrary, you know, like uh, he's more of a, a dove politically than a hawk. Um, he was uh, you know, he was very much in favour of diplomacy as a solution. Um, that's kind of a big theme in Marcus's life. So there there were other criticisms that were levelled at him, and maybe I'll share that article as well if you're interested in that aspect of the history. So there's also uh, a section about Marcus's education, which is one of my favourite parts. I'm kind of obsessed with book one of the meditations where it talks about his tutors and, you know, there's so much we can kind of tease out of that. You know, it gives us an insight. And again, a lot of it is confirmed uh, by descriptions of his education that we find in the, the Roman histories, who also think this is an important thing to know about him. And he had an exceptional education in rhetoric, Greek and Latin rhetoric, and in philosophy. Again, not just uh, Stoic philosophy, but he also was educated in Platonic philosophy, in Aristotelian philosophy. He may have studied cynicism initially, um, you know, depending on how we read some of the descriptions. He never had an Epicurean tutor, as far as we're aware. There's no mention of that. Um, although he later sponsored the chair at Athens in Epicureanism, and we know from his letters to Fronto that he was reading Lucretius, who was one of the, the famous Latin uh, Epicurean teachers, and Marcus in the Meditations quotes Epicurus. So there's just a little kind of taster about stuff we can reconstruct about his personality and his interest in philosophy from all these different sources. I wanted to mention that. It gives you a little flavour of some of the things that we can do in this course. Um... And part of his education is also understanding Marcus's psychological development and how that relates to Stoic teachings. So one of the things uh, I like to talk about in this section of the course is the Stoic idea of mentoring. And we know the Stoics wrote about psychotherapy. Chris Ipish wrote a book on psychotherapy, which is lost now. But we do actually have a source that probably tells us quite a lot about it, written by Galen, Marcus's court physician. And Galen was an incredible polymath and had studied Stoicism and wrote a book about mentoring and psychotherapy, uh, the Diagnosis and Cure of the Soul's Passions, which was influenced by Chris Ipus's book on psychotherapy and other sources. And it's very interesting to read what Galen says, because essentially he says that somebody who really wants to improve themselves and overcome the unhealthy passions and cultivate healthy ones would be well advised to find a personal mentor. And he said you should pick someone older for the simple reason that you should find someone whose life provides evidence that they actually have wisdom and virtue so someone who's proven themselves in life and so his idea was you need to seek out a person like this and then develop a relationship of trust with them where you know in the absence of modern day psychotherapy or counseling you can talk to them about what's really going on inside you and get their feedback on that an incredibly intense emotional relationship now i would speculate that marcus had that relationship with his main stoic tutor junius rusticus and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So Marcus's tutors probably served as role models to him. As we'll see, his adoptive father, the Emperor Antoninus Pius, definitely served as a role model to him. Although he wasn't a Stoic, Marcus, uh, the Stoics are perfectly happy to view non-Stoics as moral exemplars. And Antoninus, clearly, Marcus thinks he exhibits Stoic virtue. You know, in a sense, he's a natural Stoic. Like he was, Antoninus was familiar with Stoicism, but he wasn't a Stoic philosopher. 
Um, but Marcus nevertheless thinks if I want to learn virtue, this is the main guy that I need to emulate. And it's said that for about 20 years, Marcus served under him as Caesar, as his second in command at Rome, and that they were virtually never parted. Uh, so he really, really looked up to Antoninus Pius as a, a role model in life, particularly as emperor. Uh, but as a philosopher, perhaps, Marcus was a, a follower of, of mainly of Junius Rusticus. And actually, the histories use the word disciple to describe his relationship to both of these two men. Marcus, uh, there's a section talking about what Marcus says about the goal of life in Stoicism, living in agreement with nature, because he actually mentions this many times uh, throughout the meditations. And he talks about people giving him an example of what it means to live in agreement with nature, people like Rusticus, for example, and his other tutors. Two of the, the main things that Stoics do, I just wanted to touch on here, and then they'll become themes throughout the, the rest of the course. Number one, uh, very clearly articulated in Epictetus, but probably uh, something that goes really all the way back to the origins of Stoicism, is this idea of distinguishing between what's up to us and what isn't. Uh, what aspects of any given situation, particularly a troubling situation, are actually under my direct control. And so modern day Stoics have fallen into the habit of referring to that as the dichotomy of control, or sometimes I call it the Stoic fork. And I sometimes people complain about psychobabble. Um, so I, I, initially I kind of resisted the inclination to give names to some of these techniques and concepts. But over the years, and I, I've been involved with teaching Stoicism and lecturing on it for about 20 years now, I found it's just inevitable that uh, people tend to give names to things. And some of these names come from the Greek literature uh, or the Latin literature. Some of them come from modern commentators and some of them come from comparisons with modern psychotherapy techniques. But th these names have kind of evolved because generally the Stoics themselves don't tell us what these techniques are called weirdly. They describe them, they take them for granted, but they don't always say, oh, this is called doing such and such. So nowadays we do tend to talk about dichotomy of control, although it's not really a phrase that the Stoics themselves used. In any situation, what's directly under my control and what isn't? Epictetus answers that question in the Enchiridion, the handbook. Immediately after introducing this concept, he goes on to say, well, the only thing that's really under your direct control is your own action uh, or volition, if you like. The Stoics actually define this very specifically. They use a technical term called proheresis, which means moral decision-making or voluntary decisions are what uh, are ultimately under our control. And everything else for Stoics is then classed as external, not external to the body, but external to our moral decision-making, external to our volition, if you like. So that's one of the main themes in Stoicism. Another one is this idea that I call Stoic catharsis, because that's the term that Marcus uses to describe it. He calls it catharsis. Or it's very similar to a psychological technique today called cognitive distancing. And I'll, I'll be talking a lot about that, but the easiest way to introduce it, and the way it's always introduced in cognitive therapy, or almost always, is with a quote from Epictetus again, which is very famous. Uh, he said, it's not things or events, pragmata, that upset us, but our judgments about them. And he really means our value judgments about them, our judgments about what things are good or bad. It's not events that upset us, but our judgments about them. That sentence is repeated by Epictetus in different forms. It's repeated by Marcus in different forms. It's clearly one of the most fundamental psychological techniques of Stoicism happens to be one of the most fundamental techniques in modern cognitive therapy as well, under the name of cognitive distancing. Uh, we also have a, a section on how Marcus practiced the contemplation of the sage, which is another stoic exercise. Now, I wanted to get into that because it kind of logically belongs at the beginning of any training in stoicism. And so there's an audio recording and there's a transcript there uh, the Stoics would typically ask themselves, this question comes up a lot, 
So Stoics often have little verbal maxims or formulas. Sometimes there are formulated questions that they ask themselves. One of the ones that Marcus uses most often is, what virtue has nature given me to deal with this? So in any given situation, he says, what virtue or excellence, arate, has nature given me to deal with this? What can I tap into? What would be a, a good, adaptive, rational, wise way of responding to this? That's very much like in modern therapy where we ask clients what coping resources they have. You know, what would potentially, what would be a good way of coping with this problem? And that naturally leads on to another question, which is, how would other people cope with it? How would people you admire cope with it? And that's where we get into what the Stoics call contemplation of the sage, defining how the ideal person would cope with it. Imagine someone who's perfectly wise, who has a strength of character, like all of the virtues. How would they deal with this terrible thing that's happened to me? You know, what, what would be the optimum way of responding to it? So modelling excellence in that way is an important part of Stoicism and reflecting on this. There are several passages in the Meditations. Book one, Marcus reflects on the virtues of his friends, family and tutors. So he's kind of doing a similar thing. But later in the Meditations, there are several passages where he seems to be describing a mental image of a perfect Stoic sage, an ideal, but like a, the idea of a utopian society. The Stoics didn't believe that uh, there ever had been an ideal sage, but they thought it was important to imagine what one might be like if they existed. So the question they sometimes ask themselves is what would the sage do or what would uh, a near sage do like Socrates is uh, what would Socrates do like asking what would Jesus do uh, what would Zeno do what would Epictetus do and if we were modeling Marcus which some people might do some people might not want to uh, we might ask what would Marcus do is treat it as a thought experiment you know, uh, uh, with everyday problems, if there's somebody, somebody's obnoxious to you on uh, social media or if, you know, somebody steps on your toe or, you know, what would Marcus do? How would a, a Stoic respond to this situation? It's just a perspective shifting exercise. It's a way of kind of squeezing more insight out of ourselves. There's a section uh, on Marcus's disciple of Antoninus where he describes all these virtues that he can identify in his adoptive father, Antoninus Pius, the emperor that preceded him, under whom he, he studied for many years. And so I'd encourage you to comment underneath that in the discussion area. What do you think about these things that Marcus admires in Antoninus? You know, isn't it interesting that he, he he wants to model him more than anyone else, uh, even though he wasn't actually a Stoic. Nevertheless, he thinks virtue is to be found in nature. You know, there are virtuous people everywhere. There's wisdom everywhere, not just in the Stoic school. Then there's an audio, another audio exercise. There are two, I guess, in week one, um, and uh, one in the preliminary, I think. So the contemplation of the sage, so that's a harder technique to script, but I created an audio exercise that people have told me that they found useful, um, which attempts to guide you through this process of thinking about the ideal modeling virtue in a little bit more of a systematic way. Then we get into stoicism and anger management. So I could talk uh, for a long time about this, there are a bunch of other videos I've done just talking about Stoicism and anger, or Marcus and anger. Um, Marcus was angry with his main Stoic mentor, Junius Rusticus. How do we know? Because he tells us that he was. It was something that he says he struggled with. So we have stories about Rusticus. We have stories about Hadrian and Herodes Atticus, his, Marcus's rhetoric tutor, his Greek rhetoric tutor, who was famously bad-tempered and volatile man. Um, so knowing some of these bad role models perhaps drove Marcus 
to do, to live differently. It's interesting because Herodes told people he hated Stoicism. He thought it was completely unnatural to try and overcome these negative emotions. Uh, he was very anti-Stoic, but he was a terrible, terrible man. So I imagine he's almost like the anti-Rusticus. He's like Marcus looked at this guy who who he'd known his whole life. And he was a very important uh, figure in Roman society. He was a wealthy, like a billionaire. Marcus probably looked at Herodes Atticus and thought, I basically need to figure out how not to be like him. Um, this is the guy who thinks stoicism is garbage and it's pointless trying to control your emotions. You know, like, So that probably makes me think I want to study stoicism even more just so I don't turn into him. He did dreadful things. He was tried, although he was acquitted, for he married a much younger woman and uh, kicked her to death allegedly uh, when she was eight months pregnant so he was a, a domestic abuser uh, allegedly and uh, at one point he he almost attacked marcus aurelius during a, a court trial so some interesting stories about these figures in his life and you know how this relates to the philosophy and marcus's psychological and philosophical development uh, that's all in the course. The section on anger management is very interesting, I think, because Marcus gives us a very structured account of Stoic anger management, in a sense. He describes what he calls 10 gifts from Apollo and his muses, and then he rattles off a list of 10 distinct Stoic psychological strategies for coping with anger. So it's very practical, if you like. Although I found, you know, Marcus often describes perspective shifting or cognitive strategies, and I would consider those very much practical strategies, but I know from experience that some people kind of don't think of conceptual or cognitive techniques as practical, if that makes sense. It's just an oddity of teaching these things. But these, to me, are all very much practical strategies, practical exercises. Um, similar to ones that you might use in modern psychotherapy or personal development. So I'm going to kind of go through them very quickly because I don't want to go on too long today. But if you want more detail about these, there are a bunch of other videos and uh, talks that I've done about them. I'm going into them in more detail and there's a ton of stuff in the course, like a ton of reading about these exercises as well. So we plunge straight in by looking at anger and a whole armamentarium, as we say, a whole toolbox of 10 techniques for dealing with it. The, the first one is the, and this is the one that's most important to Marcus because he returns to it a number of times and he always lists it first, but it may appear cryptic to modern readers. The Stoics believe that human beings are fundamentally meant to be rational, but they also believe we're fundamentally intended to be social creatures, which is sometimes an aspect of Stoicism, the social dimension that people kind of ignore. They, but Marcus thinks it's absolutely fundamental that we overcome our alienation from the rest of mankind. Uh, and in many ways, Stoicism is a precursor of Christian ethics in this regard. The Stoics were cosmopolitans. They thought that we should learn to view all human beings regardless of uh, nationality or race or, or uh, religion as our fellow citizens in the universe, our brothers and sisters. And they believed there's a kind of oneness that we should cultivate that when we're flourishing, when we reach our potential, the, the Stoic wise man in a sense has a, a sense of oneness with the rest of humanity not on the basis of blood, as Marcus says, uh, but on the basis of shared potential for rationality. So Marcus reminds himself he's a social creature. Social creatures are designed to work as part of a community. Uh, human beings like bees or ants, the Stoics say, are destined to form communities. And then uh, therefore the Stoics believe we have an obligation that derives from that a duty to try and live well as part of a community and adapt well to other people around us. So when someone's arguing with Marcus and he's becoming angry with them, Marcus was subject to many fundamental betrayals in his life. The Marcomannic Wars began with a huge betrayal. Uh, king Balamar, a young uh, Germanic king, conspired probably for years against Marcus and then launched this attack when Rome was vulnerable. 
So Marcus was betrayed many times. Uh, he was surrounded by people uh, who were acting in bad faith. There was a civil war, an uprising against him uh, by one of his friends. But Marcus would tell himself, look, it's our nature to be social creatures. We have an obligation to try to interact well with other human beings. You know, if we want to excel as human beings, we have to do society well. We have to do interpersonal stuff well. We need to develop pro-social skills. And so he would remind himself of this kind of natural obligation that he believed that he had. Again, that may seem odd today, but it's integral to Stoicism and something that Marcus thought was very important. The second technique uh, I tend to call depreciation by analysis. So Marcus would say, try and understand the other person in a rounded way. Think about their character, their daily routine, what values compel them in life. And this is similar to another technique where Marcus talks about kind of analysing things into the components. When we're angry, anxious or upset, we naturally tend to focus our attention on threat cues in our environment. And broadening the scope of our attention, bringing in more cues, psychologically has a diluting or a damping, dampening effect often on strong emotion. So Marcus is right about this. If we try to empathise with people and understand them in a more rounded and complex way, our emotions towards them are less likely to become one-dimensional and overwhelming. So we can call that, I like to call that depreciation by analysis because Charles Bodine, an early 20th century psychotherapist who was very influenced by stoicism uses that name to describe it. The next technique is very closely related to that. I call it stoic empathy and it comes, it obviously is very much derived from something that Socrates said which is that no one does evil willingly. So Epictetus tells his students uh, specifically again to use a verbal formula he says when someone offends you you should say it seemed right to him or it seemed so to him and that's stoic empathy in a nutshell. It's trying to understand the other person's point of view, put yourself in their shoes, uh, understand the motivation for doing things rather than just assuming that they're malicious. So Marcus thinks, like, we can see some beautiful examples of this. During the Civil War, Marcus shocked everybody by Avidius Cassius, the man who tried to usurp his throne. Marcus is incredibly empathic towards him. He says, you know, there must be a reason why he's doing this. Why he must think that he's doing the right thing rather than just becoming enraged with him. That, think of the psychological maturity of somebody that's able to genuinely do that. Marcus pardoned everyone involved in that war and it's said that he even went out of his way to protect Avidius Cassius's family afterwards from persecution. The next technique I call Stoic humility, and I think it's very important to Stoicism as well. Stoicism was originally called Xenonism after the founder, um, but not for very long. They soon changed the name to Stoicism after the Stoapoikale, the porch on which they used to meet the meeting place. Now, other Greek philosophies are named after their founders, Pythagoreanism, Epicureanism. And the Stoics chose not to do that. And I think partly that was because the Stoics refused to attribute perfection or wisdom to their, their leaders. So it didn't turn into a personality cult. Zeno wasn't perfect. Chrysippus and Cleanthes weren't perfect. Epictetus isn't perfect. And the Stoics therefore admit that everybody in a sense is flawed. And they, they also want to say that everyone's on a similar footing for that reason. Um, so they, there's a sense in which they regard us all as, equal, all as all being equally flawed so it's important to admit in a sense you're no better than the person you're angry with and Marcus delves into this like really saying look you know who are you to say that in similar situation you wouldn't have acted in the same way there but for the grace of God go I you know so when you're angry you should remind yourself that you also do some of the things that the person you're angry with does and actually at a deeper level, even the very fact that you're angry with them is evidence of your imperfection, if you like. So this allows Marcus to damp down his anger by focusing on the fact that both parties are, are fallible human beings. The next one I, I call stoic scepticism sometimes. I haven't really found a good name for it. But it's the idea, as we say in modern therapy, that 
you can't mind read other people. You can't be sure what other people are thinking. So Marcus reminds himself, look, you don't really know what's going on in the mind. You don't know what Avidius Cassius is really thinking. So you can't, there's a certainty that goes with anger. Like, you know, when we're really angry, when we're really emotional, there's a kind of certainty that tends to go with it. Once we introduce mental flexibility, it tends to weaken emotions. And that means suspending judgment, introducing some degree of doubt. Uh, The Stoics believed we could be certain about some things in life, but not what is going on in someone else's mind. I think it's interesting, I notice in life often being on the receiving end of of that kind of certainty is an odd feeling. So when people argue with you, sometimes you you kind of get the feeling they're attributing views to you that you really don't hold, but they seem absolutely convinced of it. And it's kind of like they're not arguing with you, but like some cardboard cutout that's behind your shoulder or something, but they seem convinced that they know what you're thinking. Uh, often on the internet people do that they leap to conclusions about what the other person's opinions are and Marcus says we should never do that we should always be open minded and suspend judgement about what the other person might be thinking what their motives might be another technique is the contemplation of transience Uh, this too shall pass very important to Marcus in a general sense particularly in relation to anger He says, when you're angry with someone, remember that soon both of you will be dead. And not only dead, remember that both of you will be forgotten. Like, this will be as if it had never happened one day. And that kind of takes away some of the intensity of emotion, potentially. If we remember, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this is far more trivial an argument or or an insult than it seems up close. Stoic catharsis I've mentioned already, you know, it's not things that upset us but our judgments about them. Marcus specifically adapts that to anger and says it's not other people's actions that upset us but our judgments about them. That's kind of like saying sticks and stones can may break your bones but words will never hurt me. Uh, it's just hot air. Now I have to qualify that by saying, and, and I, this is a very important general point to make it at this stage in the course, There are two caveats I'd attach to that. It is intended to be a simplification. And the Stoics are aware that things are a little bit more complex than that. And the two things I would say that I think are very important because people ask about them a lot. are Number one, the Stoics, both Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius explicitly mention this. The Stoics are very aware that some emotional responses are involuntary and not really mediated by voluntary cognitive judgments so uh, they believe look if someone runs up behind you and gives you a fright you're going to jump out of your skin and that anxiety isn't really mediated by value judgments uh, it's shared with animals that don't even use language and it may even be that some forms of anger uh, are primitive reflex like emotional reactions animals get have something like anger they, they exhibit aggression uh, if they're threatened for example but the stoic doesn't perpetuate that or escalate it he doesn't add value judgments on top of it he's not swept along with it so the stoics say that those feelings propathei these involuntary initial emotional reactions are indifferent they're neither good nor bad they're natural they're inevitable and so we should accept them with indifference rather than trying to struggle against them. That's important to spell out at the beginning. The Stoics are not advising us to try to suppress involuntary emotions. That would be very bad psychological advice, potentially unhealthy. The other thing I'd say is that the Stoics do n- are not cold-hearted. They, don't ex- they admit that everyone is flawed, as I mentioned earlier. From that, it follows that other people cannot be expected to behave like the Stoic sage. Actually, a good example of that would be on social media, on the discussion groups I run. Sometimes people will come on and kind of say insulting things to the the rest of the group, and then they'll say, well, you guys are all into stoicism. You know, you should uh, be indifferent to other people's insults. But the truth is that nobody is perfectly stoic. And, you know, therefore, when we're interacting with other people, the stoics believe to some extent we should be respectful of that, that they're bound to take offence and they're bound to make those value judgments um, because they're not perfect sages, none of us are. So that those are the two kind of caveats I would add to that. Some emotions are involuntary, 
and the Stoic assumes that other people are not perfect sages. The, then the final two techniques that Marcus mentions for coping with anger, number one, uh, modelling virtue, which we've touched on already. And so in relation to anger, he particularly men mentions that the antidote to anger, as he calls it, the remedy for anger, is the Stoic virtue of kindness. Now that's worth mentioning because one of the cardinal virtues in Stoicism is justice. And that, unfortunately, is not a great translation of the Greek term that's used. It's very difficult to find an adequate translation. The Stoics clearly tell us that what they mean by this interpersonal or social virtue, uh, the, this virtue that, that really has to do with how we interact with other people individually and collectively, it, it consists mainly of fairness or treating them uh, in a fair manner and also kindness or goodwill towards them, wanting them to flourish. Now, Stoics would say that obviously the flourishing of another person is not under our direct control. Nevertheless, it's pursued with the reserve clause to introduce another technical term. So we want other people to flourish, become wise and do well while admitting that it's not directly under control if they do so. So we pursue it in a detached manner. That's integral to Stoicism. And so that's really what the Stoic virtue of kindness consists in, or goodwill towards others. Then Stoics therefore think, Marcus talks a lot about this in this passage, that we should communicate with other people tactfully. He really stresses that. That unlike cynics who just bark the truth at people, Stoic plain speaking consists of communicate, communicating with other people in an appropriate, sensitive, diplomatic manner. Marcus, we can see from his private letters, was incredibly adept at doing this. It's no surprise that a major part of his career was his uh, skill as a diplomat. The last point, which he says comes from Apollo himself, the last technique is basically Stoic determinism. And Marcus says, look, the world is full of good and bad people. Like the majority of people are ignorant and vicious and prey to the passions to some extent, just like you are yourself. Therefore, it would be foolish to assume that bad people don't exist or that bad people don't do bad things. So the Stoics say, look, any reasonable human being who reflects on life will have to expect that from time to time people will do crazy, irrational or offensive things. And so we should never act surprised. Just as sure as leaves fall in the autumn, it's part of nature that these things happen to us in life. I think that's a very important point for many reasons. But one is the Stoics are absolutely right that many there are many cognitive features that exacerbate negative emotion and one of them is surprise. So how many times have you heard people saying, I can't believe he did that? Now, very simply, the Stoic wise man would say, I can totally believe that he did that. Of course, people do these things. Why, if you think about it, often the things that we say, I can't believe this. I can't believe it's happening. How, would, how could someone do this? Are things that we shouldn't really be that surprised by. And so the Stoic sage says, this is kind of fake surprise. There's something phony about it. We're deceiving ourselves into being more surprised, more shocked by things than we should be. And that's really just a kind of rhetorical device that we're employing on ourselves to amplify our own emotions, which isn't a good thing to get in the habit of doing. The Stoics think we should view events more objectively, more rationally, so that our emotions are basically proportionate to the situation and not blown out of proportion. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to some of the practical stuff that Marcus says about anger. I hope I haven't gone on too long. I think we've been about an hour. It's a little bit longer than I'd planned, but yeah, I do tend to go on a bit sometimes because it's a subject I'm very interested in. A little bit of a look ahead. Week two is about Marcus's early reign. Week one was more about his education. Uh, it's about how to deal with worry and anxiety and the many catastrophes that befell him at the beginning of his reign. Uh, plague, earthquakes, famine, floods, uh, the Marcomannic War, the Parthian War. There are a bunch of things that he had to deal with, almost like he was being tested by the universe. Uh, week three is about Marcus going to war, uh, the Marcomannic War, 
coping with pain and illness. This is the time, almost certainly, when he wrote the meditations, so the significance of that. And week four is about the civil war and Marcus's later life, his death, coping with loss, the loss of his children, the loss of his wife, his adopted brother, his father, his stoic mentor. There's a lot of death in Marcus's life. How he coped with that and the significance of it, coming to terms with his own mortality. Uh, Socrates said that all philosophy is a preparation for death, a milite thanatu, a contemplation of death and a rehearsal of death. And the Stoics make that a central part of their psychological practice. So that's what we've got to look ahead to. Uh, a lot of pain, anxiety and death coming up. But also, um, I wanted to just, I'll mention this now, if you don't mind me tagging on a little appendix. I kind of forgot about it earlier. I said a little bit about the importance of the contemplation of virtue. Now, and I said a little bit about, I mentioned stoic joy. Someone asked me about this, I wanted to emphasise it. Although joy isn't the goal for stoics, it's a kind of side effect of the goal, I think they would say that trying to pursue it directly could potentially lead us in the wrong direction. And I'd, I'd, I'd talk more about that if I, if I had a little bit more time. They, I think it's a very insightful thing for them to, to say. The, the main source of joy for Stoics is the contemplation of virtue in themselves. Excellent. If we say virtue, it sounds really pompous. Um, the, when you know that you're acting consistently with your own va most important values in life, there's a kind of satisfaction, a rational form of satisfaction that comes from that and the Stoics think that deep sense of joy or serenity almost like, is more important than the pleasure that comes from enjoying external things like they would say they're not trying uh, just to take away pleasure from us they want to replace hedonic pleasure hedonistic pleasure uh, with something that they think is much more important a kind of spiritual contentment or joy that's much more deep-seated, it comes much more from within. It has to do with knowing that you're doing the right thing, knowing that you're on the right course in life, that you're living in accord with virtue, that you're living consistently with the goal of life. And they think that's the main source of this lasting, stable, deep-seated, rational joy that we can maybe glimpse if we're lucky in life, but it's worth infinitely more than the pleasure that you get from eating a bar of chocolate or something. And but Marcus also mentions two other sources of joy and uh, the, this kind of maps on to a threefold structure that we find in Stoicism. So the Stoics talk about our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with society and our relationship with nature as a whole, particularly the events that befall us. And this maps on to various aspects of Stoicism. They think we should kind of live rationally, wisely and in harmony with these three levels in life. So this one is how we kind of relate to ourselves and they think it's the most important source of joy. But another source of joy is contemplation of the virtue in others. Even what they call the seeds, the glimpses, the traces of virtue that are exhibited in other people's behaviour. And partly because we can learn from it and model it ourselves, that's perfectly exemplified by all the stuff that Marcus says about the virtues of his teachers in education and Antoninus Pius. He says that remembering the virtues that we perceive in other people is one of the main sources of delight in life. It's one of the healthiest sources of delight. And he does that for the whole of the first book in the meditations. So it's interesting to see him talking about this from a kind of theoretical point of view, then actually doing it very thoroughly. Uh, and he also returns to it later in the meditations, actually listing the virtues of his role models. So contemplating our own progress, contemplating the glimpses of, uh, of virtue in other people, um, acknowledging, by the way, that we can know for sure that they definitely are virtuous. It's just the semblance of virtue in their outward behaviour like, that we might you know, take inspiration or learn from. And the third one is, is a little bit more cryptic, but Marcus says that we can, there's a form of delight that we can legitimately take from external experiences um, when we accept things that befall us which are in accord with nature. And so although the Stoics are indifferent towards all external things, some external things are better than others. So Stoic wisdom consists in understanding the value, axia, they say, of external things. It's not a level playing field. There are some things 
external to us that we naturally prefer and some that we disprefer, as the Stoics put it in their technical language. Of course, we naturally prefer to be healthy than to be sick, although these things are ultimately indifferent with regard to moral virtue. That's how the Stoics might put it. But when things that we value do befall us, like Marcus thinks that there's a legitimate form of delight that we can take in contemplating them. And he says something interesting, that most people desire things uh, that they don't have, and when they imagine those things as if they had them, it intensifies their desire and potentially contributes to their suffering. And Marcus thinks we should do the contrary, that rather than imagining things that we don't have and desiring them even more, we should contemplate the things that we do have as if they were gone or think about their transience so that we are more grateful for them. And our gratitude for the things that we do have is a healthier source of delight that's worth cultivating. But then he qualifies that, he is very guarded about this, that we, in doing so, we have to be careful that we don't become so attached to the things that we're grateful for that it would hurt us if they were taken away. So these, when it comes to these external things, he's kind of, he has to attach some caveats to it. But it's interesting that he says, rather than craving things we don't have, a better source uh, of joy would be to learn gratitude for the things that we do have by uh, what's sometimes called in psychology a downward comparison rather than an upward comparison. You know, kind of imagining how much worse off we could be potentially, um, which is something that's quite alien to our society today, I think. It's so aspirational. You know, we're always taught to look at celebrities and all the material stuff that we could have. It's seldom are people really encouraged to think how much better off they are than they could be. And Marcus thinks it's worth trying to cultivate this. It's just healthy for us to do it that way. So uh, I hope that I haven't overwhelmed you too much. Like, but I wanted to kind of give you something that you could get your teeth into that's practical with the anger and also a bit of a, an orientation to stoicism and to the course in general. And I will just have a, a skim through. I'm glad you guys like the course, cool. Looking at your comments. Do we know what age Marcus lost his father? Uh, his birth father, we don't know exactly, but it's believed to be round about when Marcus was age three. And, and then his adoptive father uh, Marcus would have been like 40 when he uh, succeeded Tim uh, but he lost his um, his birth father when he was just a small child any other questions I don't think there's any other questions for in the chat for now if you think about this and you have any other questions for me afterwards if you just wait like about it takes about five minutes i think and then you come back to this link and refresh your browser there'll be comment section underneath and then you can post permanent comments there and i'll go back and read that tomorrow or whatever and i'll answer any questions that appear there but for now thanks for taking part remember uh you can also email me directly if you've got any questions and thanks so much for actually coming along and listening to this and hi to anyone that's watching the recording afterwards and so i should say goodbye uh, from me here in nova scotia and i'll see you all again at the same time next sunday for uh, the beginning of week two bye